How did Paul share Jesus with people who'd never heard of him? Hmm. You know, it, okay, it reminds me of this <laughs> the story he was telling me. He went to this place called Athens. I, I, I have to be honest, I've never been there. Don't know where it is exactly. Something about hummus and I don't know. Anyway, he went to this place and these people were crazy in the nicest way, I'm sure, but they had a God for everything. Oh, I stubbed my toe. I shall pray to the God of my stubbed toe to mend it, to fix it, to make me feel better. Well, yeah, time is going to heal that. It's not going to be the toe God. Or, or maybe they had a, a sick hamster. Oh, they're going to pray to the sick hamster God. So all these people had gods for absolutely everything. And in, in Paul listening to this, he said, it, the only thing that made sense to me was to pretty much let him know, hey, you know what? I feel you, brother. I feel you. But here's the thing, isn't it hard to keep up with all those gods? Well, let me tell you about my God. How about I introduce you to a God that you can meet, you can talk with him anytime you want about any problem, any situation, because here's the thing, it's not, he's not just a God that you can go to when you have a problem, you can share your victories with him too, and he cares. <laughs> he actually cares, he listens. And he'll talk back. Not like your, you know, your bratty sister talking back to your mom or dad. That wouldn't be good. But he will listen, he will communicate with you. And if you truly open your mind, your heart, your soul, yeah, and your ears and your eyes, you'll learn a lot. And so by him introducing to these crazy people who worshiped all the gods, the idea that there is one God who cares about you because their gods didn't necessarily care about them. But this God does, and he'll listen. Wow. You know, I don't know about you, but decluttering my life? <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible with remembering names and try to remember the names of all these gods in the cosmos. Whatever, just give me the one guy who I can go to who's gonna take care of it for me right now. So that, that's a great question. So. It makes me think, what are you doing to help God know you better? You have to open yourself up. Are you? Okay, good. Well, good morning. What a joy to see all of you here on this incredible first Sunday in June. Can you believe that? First Sunday in June. It's been a quick year. Uh, before I get into my sermon, I want to just thank a couple of people. We have a kids area on the other side there of the property where our kids hang out. And you guys spend so much time investing time and resources and energy and money and prayers. And part of that is our nursery. And we noticed that there was a, an aroma coming from the nursery. And so we said, let's fix that. And so we fixed it. We renovated it. We tore out the carpet. We repainted. We got brand new cabinets and all new supplies in there. And there were a, a, an incredible group of you that did that for us. And so we just want to say thank you to, so I'm going to list a few names here that just spent hours and a lot of time here that most people wouldn't be, even be aware of. But Jeff and Renee Shoup spent basically two weeks here. Uh, thank you. Scott Allsberger spent hours upon hours. Uh, Barry and Betty Hayes, they did a tremendous amount of work. Lauren Wold, Matt Brozvik, Herb Landis, and a few others that didn't want to be mentioned. Thank you. The, again, we believe that we are all ministers of the gospel here. We all have our gifts and talents and abilities, and we all bring what we have, and we say, here, let's make a difference in our community. Let's do some great things for God. And so those these people are great at that. They came in, spent hours upon hours, and so thank you for making this place better. Thanking, thank you for making our nursery not stinky. We're very, <laughs> uh, we, we have, we do really appreciate that. It looks good. Feel free to take a walk back there after the service. We, we ha you have to be in order to get in. You have to be background checks. So we're not just going to let adults walk back there during the service, so hang tight. But after the kids have gone or been dismissed and their parents have picked them up, feel free to take a look in there. We're doing some good work. So thank you. Many, many hands made that possible. Grateful for that. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, whom I love dearly, we were at my parents' house, 
and he was showing me this thing that I had never heard of before. I remember just sitting there, stunned in my, my parents' backyard. I was getting sunburned. The sun was there. It's beating down on me. And, and Patrick is showing me these things that were completely foreign to me. And since this time, my life has been completely changed. He showed me this thing called an app. I, I'd never heard of such a thing. From his phone, he pulled up the Bible. And I thought, wow, this will make my job so much easier. Everywhere I go, I have the Bible. I can look up things. It was incredible. He was able to text and do he was able to look up movies right there in my parents' backyard. It was, he was able to listen to music. I remember that day because what was unknown to me suddenly became known. And now, let's face it, I'm addicted. I, I'm addicted to my phone. You guys have that same problem? But something that was unknown, all of a sudden somebody says, here, check this out. This will change your life. And it did. Well, we are in a series about Paul. It's called a submitted life. And as we've looked at Paul's life over the past few weeks, I hope you've noticed that Paul has given his life completely over to God. He has he said, God, my life is yours. He's looked at that throughout the course of his writings. We've seen him quote his quotes. And he has walked a submitted life where he surrendered his to God. And then everything he did from that point on was about doing the next right thing. What's the next right thing that God has asked him to do? He would go do it. So he goes on missionary trips. He has discipled people. He's experienced conflict. He's experienced suffering. His life was dramatically changed because he encountered the risen Jesus and his life will, has never been the same and neither was history. His life became about doing what God said to do. And so hopefully, hopefully this is our journey. We encounter the risen Jesus, and it changes our life, and we want to share what we've learned with others. We want to disciple and train what we've learned with others. We, we know that we're going to suffer. We know we're going to experience conflict, and how do we do that in a godly way? And so we've, we've looked at that. So that's where we're at. Um, we, we work through that. We want our character to look more and more like Jesus, just like Paul was. So this morning's story is about a time when Paul was traveling throughout Asia and Europe, and he ends up in the city of Athens, this incredible Greek city. And he begun to tell the people of, the, of Athens about a guy who was dead and then became risen from the dead and was alive, so much so that 500 people saw this man who was dead, now alive. They now saw him, including Paul. They saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And so Paul starts telling people about this, and people were curious. So they said, let's hear more. So they, they took Paul up to the place called the Areopagus. Oh, I knew I was going to mess it up. I practiced that word over and over again. Areopagus. He took him up to the Areopagus, or as we call it, Mars Hill, so that this is where the weighty matters of Athens were discussed. They'd sit, they'd debate, all kinds of stuff. So they take Paul up to the Areopagus, and they say, tell us more. So this is our passage. We're in Acts 17. 22 through 31, Luke writes this. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Europagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also in an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we in, are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
So Paul is in this foreign land and he starts telling people about Jesus. And he, he communicates a story about a person who these people have never heard of. They have no background of the God of Israel. They have no background about this guy named Jesus. And so he has to come into this setting and try to explain this God that they've never heard of and this person they've never heard of to them. So how does he do this? He, he wants to tell them about a person who's changed his life. How does Paul communicate a message completely different from what people have heard before? Well, th that's a tough one for us because we have a message in our society, but people have heard some version of Jesus before. It's almost to the point where they, they think they know about Jesus, but they've they actually don't. We have holidays that celebrate Jesus, but do they really know what this Jesus is about? So we have, we have a different, different way to try to communicate to our, our neighbors and friends and family members. And Paul gives us, in the midst of this story, though, he gives us tremendous insight into how we can communicate the story of Jesus to people around us. Number one, the first thing that Paul does is he finds common ground. He finds common ground with them. He says in that verse 22 through 23, he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So he says, hey, I notice you're religious. I'm religious. I like talking about God. Let's talk about God. You guys have altars everywhere. I have, an, I have a God that I'm familiar with. Let's, let's talk about this. So he finds some common ground. The people of Athens were very spiritually aware. They had gods everywhere. They, they had many temples and places of worship. We, in fact, there's kind of been a renaissance recently of studying the Greek gods, and there's been fictional writers kind of resurrecting those ideas of, of the Greek pantheon, and kids are getting more interested in it again. And, uh, they, the Athens people, they had so many gods that they thought, man, we might be missing one. Let's, let's name him the unknown God. And so, actually, there's the legend of how that came about. The legend of Athens is that there was one day a plague in the city of Athens, and it was just vicious and brutal. People were getting sick and dying, and so the people were sacrificing to all the gods they could think of, and the plague was not subsiding. So one farmer, one shepherd, he says, I, I got an idea. Let's, let's take a flock of sheep up to the Oropagus, to Mars Hill, and let's just let the sheep go. And wherever they stop, let's sacrifice to, the, to some god right there. And let's see if we can end this plague. And so they do. And what ends up happening is, finally, the plague begins to subside. The plague goes away. And so they end up building altars to this unknown god. And there are, and besides our scripture, there are other numerous documents where the gods of the unknown gods would be worshipped. And so Paul takes this idea, this hunger for gods, and he says, hey, I think I know a God that you may not be aware of. He recognizes that the Greeks have a desire and a hunger for the spiritual. He sees that in their hearts, and he uses that to, trans to transfer that idea about Jesus. He recognizes that they, they didn't have this one truth. They had all kinds of ideas, but he had a, 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 an idea or the truth that they didn't have yet. So he delivers it to the news to the Greeks. And he starts off, he doesn't start off by saying, hey, you're wrong. You have all these gods, you're dead wrong. Do you know how many Christians start off with conversations with that? With, hey, I see you want to hear something about Jesus. Let's just start off by you're wrong. Uh, I, I know when I've been debating people about Jesus, sometimes I've started off that way. And do you know that it's never gone well when we start off with you're wrong? Yeah. The better way to do that is to start off with, hey, let's talk about where can we find some common ground? Where can we find some places of agreement? And so when we, he starts off by saying, hey, I notice you're religious. I notice you like the idea of spirituality and gods. What that does is that opens our hearts and minds, and we at least begin to have the idea of openness and conversation. And so we, when we are in our community sharing the love of Jesus, I think we can start off by sharing some commonalities with people of, oh, I notice that you're spiritually hungry. You have some spiritual questions. I notice you're interested in the things of God or notice you're looking for something greater than you. I notice you're looking for some meaning and purpose. We can begin by finding open ground and common ground so that we can start to have conversation with people instead of saying, hey, uh, you know, you're going to hell and I need to tell you about it. 
it just makes things much more awkward quickly. And so, you know, we'll get to that point, but let's just start, let's have a conversation about it. And so, um, I know that when we use this method, we're able to have a better conversation. And so, there's a lot in this world that I notice people seeking spirituality. They, they have a hunger for it, so we can use that for our benefit. They, I, I know that there are, there's a lot in this world that we don't have in common, but there is also something that we do. Just like the Greeks sp- sought spirituality, they sought out the gods. Our culture, our society is desperate for something bigger than us. It's desperate for meaning and purpose. It's desperate for love and grace and acceptance. This is the message that we can bring. We can share people this exact message. And so we come in and we say, hey, I notice you're looking for these things. Me too. And I think I have found an answer. We can start off with, uh, we can have long conversations with people about this idea of, of opening their hearts and minds to it. And I just, I've discovered that when in conversations with you and when I watch the news, when I look on social media, people are desperate for meaning and significance and for having a bo- sense of belonging. Now, what happens is, is people search out that, and when they think they find it, it starts spinning them in all kinds of different ways. So many work hard to achieve status for their family. They think that's their God. That's where they find their spirituality is in status or influence. Many attempt to find fulfillment or meaning in marriage or entertainment or possessions. And we, the list can go on. But what happens is, is when we seek answers or meanings apart from God, what happens is chaos. And we notice that in our world. And so when we're looking at the world around us, our, our hearts shouldn't be, look at how wrong they are. Our hearts are saying, they are desperate for something, and we have an answer. We, we have something we can bring to them. They're longing for something greater than them, and we know what the answer is. We can bring that. So we can, we can bring that to our friends and family. So number two, Paul then, he starts to call into question their beliefs. He says, hey, I noticed this. Let me, let's look at that. So he says in this uh, verse 23, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So one pastor I heard, he says that what we can do as Christians is we can biopsy culture. By that, what he means is we can take part of what's going on in our world and pull it out, examine it, ask questions about it, reflect on it, and see if it's true. So let's let's take, for example, the phrase, if it feels good, do it. That's a common phrase. If it feels good, do it. I, I just have to tell you, I think eating a donut feels good. And then... Five minutes later, my gut says that was a terrible decision. Just go, oh, I just, can't, I, I just can't do it anymore. So you notice, I, I don't eat donuts here on Sunday mornings. It's not because I don't find them delicious. They are delicious. It's the five minutes after I go, not worth it. It's just not. And so, but if I just feels good, do it. At what point do I stop listening to that feels good, do it? Because five minutes later, Not a good idea. And so, but our world says, if it feels good, just do it. Who cares how you feel five minutes later? And I've just learned, I just don't want to live like that. I'd rather worry more about the long-term consequences, but our world has full of ideas like, if it feels good, do it. Or, uh, and so we can investigate, we biopsy these ideas. And so it, it may not be, it may feel good in the moment, but is it worth the pain now? And I just think, We can examine these words of our culture. We can examine what the culture says and ask questions and ask our friends and family about it. Say, oh, you say this. How is that working for you? Is that that really what you're experiencing? And Paul does this with the people of Athens. He says that they acknowledge that a God exists that's unknown. And here's where I think it's really interesting. He says, what you worship. They have at the core of their belief system this idea of worshiping objects. They sacrifice objects to God so that they get what they want. So it's a very um, idol, statues, all these kind of trinkets and toys of worship. Places, that's what's worshipped here. And so they have, they have Mount Olympus. All of these things that they're looking to, that's a what. Uh, they, they have, I'll just give you a couple ideas, love, hunt, um, chaos. All of these are different gods in the Greek pantheon. They worship the what. 
And people's res- natural response is to worship what? We, we like to worship things. Wealth, materials. We're going to talk about that ne- uh, next week. We're talking about idols. But we like to worship tangible things that we can control. And, and so this is what they're doing. So Paul highlights that this is a problem in humanity. You're worshiping what? And, but he says, he, he exposes their ignorance. He says that he actually has a who. Not a what, but a who. And this is, so he's, he's starting to press on their idea of knowledge. And this is dangerous for Paul. Because this is Athens, Greece. The home of Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Pythagoras. I know we're all fans of Pythagoras with this Pythagorean theorem in math. That guy stresses me out even mentioning his name. But anyway... He, he's, he's in the heart of knowledge, and he's saying, hey, by the way, did you know you're ignorant? So he's trying to draw them in. He's, he's playing a dangerous game, but what he's saying is, you worship a what, and I worship a who. That would be, be intriguing to them. That's different from the world around them. So he's drawing them in, and I think that this is where Christians can often get lost, as well as our friends and family who often don't know Jesus. And by that, I mean it is far easier to worship a set of rules or, or to follow a set of guidelines and a list of behaviors rather than a God. If I'm worshiping a set of rules and I'm just trying to follow a system of behaviors, I can do that. I can check my list. I can know whether I'm good or bad, whether I've done enough to be better than my neighbor, so I'm in heaven. And Paul is saying it's not about what you do or worshiping what. Rather, it is about a God who can be known. Very, very different. And I can give my list of church attendance, tithe records, good deeds. I can show to whomever wants to whether I'm worthy or unworthy. And this is what Greeks would have wanted. They wanted to know, do I know the right things? Am I worthy enough to be considered good? That's, that's what they were after. And he claims that these people are unaware of the true God and his very nature. God is not a what, he is a who. Sometimes you still catch that in the way we talk about the Holy Spirit. We'll say that or it. But the Holy Spirit is a person, he, who. That's, so we, we even still can kind of follow in that. So our society begins to tell us how we should live and what truth is. And we can begin to then examine those thoughts. And we can begin to ask questions to our friends and our family members and say, okay, you, you say to define my own truth. You can say that uh, our identities are disconnected from our bodies. You say that all paths lead to God. Well, let's, let's examine that. Let's just ask where this process goes. All with the knowledge that we don't, ask a, we don't serve a what, but we serve a who. And that is very different. So he brings to light some of the belief systems of the Greeks, and he offers a different solution and points them to the true God. So then he gets into the claims of who the true God is. Verses 24 through 25. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So again, here's where Paul, he went from what to who. So he says that the way we worship is different. So he says that God actually has a personality and a presence. That we can interact with this God. That we can communicate with this God. And that we simply don't, we don't have to live by sacrifices or or doing doing a certain set of ritual practices. But rather, the way we interact with God is very different. So he says that three things that God is not. Three things that God is not. He says, number one, that God does not live in a temple made by people. Well, that would have been very different. There's all kinds of altars and temples in Athens and all over Greece. Number two, God is not served by human hands like he needs something. God is not served by human hands like he needs. So we don't, God isn't saying, okay, go do this because I need you to burn sacrifices. I need you to kill these animals so that I can eat. That's not what God does. And it says that God is not an idol that can be carried around or made by man. And that's in verse 29. So just a, a little section down later. So God is not those things. So what's fascinating about all three of those is that these are deeply Old Testament ideas that Paul uses to expose the truth about who God is. But Paul doesn't quote 
scripture and verse and start pounding on about the Old Testament scroll. He doesn't say, in 1 Amos 13, 47, and I totally made that up. He doesn't start pounding on, this, on the scripture and say, you have to believe because in this passage in scripture. He doesn't do that. Why? The people don't know scripture. They don't care about the Israel God. They don't know anything about it. Their scripture isn't his scripture. They don't care. And a lot of times, Christians, they'll show up and they'll say, well, in my Bible, it says this and this. And the people say, great, I don't care. But what he does is he has scripture so ingrained into who he is. He's become so a part of God and he knowing who God is and what God's word says that he can reference it without having to pound it out scripture. He can use it to communicate in a way that's actually helpful. So he doesn't have to quote verse in scripture, but he's really grasping the ideas of what God has said throughout the ages. So I think we can learn from that. The problem is, is that for many of us, we don't have God's word in our heart that we can pull from it. We, we've become so reliant on our phones. We've been so reliant on people to, to call or to ask for help that when we come up against somebody that actually is kind of we're having a conversation, we don't know what's true or not. We don't know how to ask questions because we haven't investigated. We haven't internalized God's word in, in our hearts and minds so that we can say, oh, I, I know what's going on here. I, we can go through the scripture and say, oh yeah, I remember. But we don't have to quote it. We just say, well, hey, God, God's a God of grace. This is how I know God's a God of grace because he's loved people. All throughout history, God's a God of love and grace. Or, well, that doesn't seem right because I know God builds up women. He doesn't tear down women throughout Throughout our belief system, God is always lifting up to equality. Any time where human or man is pressing down on women is a sign that there's sin. So that doesn't seem right. So we can work through things on our own without having to reference Scripture, but we are. So again, we're trying to communicate to people around us in a way that they'll receive, and Paul does that here. He has a deep understanding and knowledge of God. He, he knows God. He's, God has become so part of his life, he's able to express it in a way that is, has a universal appeal, and, then, and it can be explored and explained. He's saying, I know God's message is important for all of you. Let me explain how this works. So I think if we want to make a difference in the world around us, we have a responsibility to do the work of knowing God, of getting God's word into our heart. And so pastors talk all the time about reading our Bible. We do that because we know that the Bible shapes how we think. It transforms our mind and our hearts. And so we want God to get inside of our soul so that we can begin making a difference in the world around us. That starts by just knowing God's word. And again, we can become really lazy. We can become reliant on other things. We, We want to get into the scripture and know God. The other thing is small groups. Small groups help us work through these conversations. The amount of times where I start an idea and somebody says, well, what about this? I go, oh, that's a much better way to communicate that. And so, or I hadn't thought of that. So we get in small groups and we talk about Jesus because that helps us build our faith. It helps shape our our souls, our minds and our hearts. And so we're able to work through tough ideas with friends and family members who love us and care about us and love Jesus too. So we shape, that's how we're able to shape what's going on around us. So we get in small groups that helps us know God. Or we have discipleship classes and other classes that will help help us know who God is. We talk all the time about Discover School of Ministry here. It's a discipleship program. It's a two-year program. It'll start in September where you can walk through your knowledge of the Bible. You walk through what it is to follow Jesus and learn skills about following Jesus so that we begin to know Jesus. So again, when we are out in our community, we have him living and dwelling. He's changing who we are so that we can decide whether something in our world is true or not. We can make an impact around us. Okay, so our culture often shapes us. And Paul is saying, no, I'm going to use culture to shape them. And I'm going I'm to use what God has inside of me and we'll change it around a little bit. We want to be the people who are shaping others around us. So at the, Paul of, at the center of Paul's message, It's his claim for who God truly is. Listen to what he says in verses 26 through 27. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. 
yet he's actually not far from each one of us. So Paul says that this unknown God, the one they hadn't heard of, is actually the source of all creation. The Greeks believed that the gods were in everything. So Zeus was the god of the sky. Poseidon was the god of the sea. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. Artemis is the goddess of the hunt. So if you're in those areas, or you see those areas, the god or goddess is involved in that process. And Paul says, this God is over and above all of those things. He's the source. He's greater than, than all that. In fact, all of creation derives from this God. This is a very different way of looking at things. And so then, then he says that God created one man. And that from this one man, all of humanity exists. The Greeks, this would have been a, a completely different view for the Greeks. The Greeks believed that they were the supreme beings of all, of all humanity. Everybody else that was not a Greek was a barbarian and was a lesser class. And Paul says, no, there's one man and from everyone else we've all come from, which means we are all equal, all ethnicities, all nations, all tribes, all people groups. We are all equal because we come from the same source. This was a very different way of looking at things back then. Guess what? That message still speaks to us today. We still have people that think that whatever nationality or race or ethnic group, that for some reason that's better than others. And we have people that are wanting to separate the groups. And this is what I think is interesting about Jesus. After the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes, what they're doing is, I think, they're putting back the pieces. They're trying to reintegrate humanity to God. And a part of that is by taking the people groups and bringing them back together. If we go all the way back to Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel, when because people were worshiping themselves, all of a sudden their tongues and, and languages get confused and they split off and they create different ethnic groups and nationalities. Because of sin, all those things split up. And at, when the Holy Spirit comes, what he does is he ends up bringing back people together. So when we're seeing people be separated... That is anti what God is doing. God brings unity and harmony and peace, not separation and division. We, I'll, I'll pause there. Um, Paul, Paul fights against the claim, though, that ethnicities are better than the others. So uh, the, the work here then is Paul is saying, we're all in this together. Paul then goes on to say that they, God created for people dwelling places, places to live, times to which they live. Again, this goes back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 28 says this, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over birds of the heavens and over everything living that moves on the earth. So God's intention for humanity was to live in a place that was good, where they could dwell and have nuclear families. Where he created the idea of families where husband and wives would raise their children together and that they would rule over the land and care for God's creation. This was considered good at the time. Sin comes in and begins to separate that. So even our very first family that ever existed, what happened? Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Instant train wreck. Satan, the enemy, comes in and brings separation and murder and sin and pain and agony. That is what our enemy seeks to do. He seeks to tear apart the family. And here Paul is saying, hold on, God intended for our families to be together, for our families to live in harmony where it's just good and helpful and healthy. He intended for our families to, to love one another. And instead of, it was supposed to be a place where we found joy and, and welcome and acceptance. And oftentimes, family can be just agonizing and painful. And instead of it being a place that gives us life, our family members can suck the life out of us. And, God, and Paul is saying, that is not how God intended it to be. And he is bringing to them a God who says, there's a different way that we can live. God intended for our families to live in harmony together. Let's work through this. I know the God that created this idea. He brought life and, and abundance to us and, and health. So Paul is saying that, we can, that this is the God who brings all this. Then he says, uh, let's see. That we, there's something inside of us that has a desire for something greater than us. That God built in us a desire for himself. That if we seek after God, we'll find him. 
And our current society reflects this statement by Paul so well because we have people looking for things all over the place. We're constantly on the look for something greater. You can see it in the way people get really worked up about whatever their cause is. They're looking for something that they can control to say, our world is messed up, let's fix this. That is us looking for something important. It reminds me of the famous U2 song. I know we have a lot of U2 fans in here, uh, but they're a great band. Uh, they, they sing the song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And the, the idea behind that song is he's searching for God to come in and he's longing for something great. And Paul takes this idea that every single human being seeks out something and he's hoping that God will then fill it for us. If we know Jesus, this is a message that translates to our friends and family. We have something that, they're, that he says they're seeking for, almost groping for, grasping for. And Paul says, I know who created that longing for you, and that longing that we have is for him. He wants us to find him. So God, to know God is our purpose in life. Our purpose is to know God and worship him. That's why it's important we come together on Sunday mornings and we sing praises and we turn our attention to him because that's what we were designed to do is to turn our affection. And so when we sing songs, it's not just, you know, to, for those of you that like music. There's something about music that opens up our hearts and minds and we say, yeah, I, I need to worship Jesus with my whole being. And so we, 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 that's part of how we were created. Our purpose is to know God and enjoy him. I have to wonder if many of us and our loved ones are lost because we are searching for something that can only be found in Jesus. And so we turn our attention to something that is not God, hoping, grasping for it, hoping for fulfillment, and it's not him. And so when we place our hope and trust in our lives in Jesus, then we're headed in the right direction. He is the hope of our world. So Paul says something really remarkable here in Acts 17, 27. He says that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. God is not far from each one of us. Sometimes, there are some days where I really question that statement. There are some days where I say, God, I sure don't feel you today. I wish you were near me. Where are you? And Paul reminds us, that God is there, that he's, he's grasping for it. He's right there reaching out saying, I'm right here. I've never left. Reach out for me and I'm there. Seek me and you'll find me. God is straining for us. He is by our side. If you are looking for something today, God is by your side. This is really good news. Then Paul does something again interesting. He quotes Greek philosophers. He uses their culture and he points back to Jesus using their words. Verses 28, he quotes them. He says, In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So he's taking some of the own Greek philosophers' ideas and he's saying, Hey, you guys recognize your longing, and I know the answer. This would be like us using our culture and pointing it to Jesus. Like, say, something like a U a U2 lyric and saying, hey, we do search for something. Or maybe when people, we can look at a Marvel movie and say, notice how they're looking for saviors. They're constantly looking for somebody to come and rescue humanity. Why is that? Why are so many TV shows or, or movies about redemption? Because we need redemption. What is that? What is that longing? And so he grasps their own culture and he says, look, you yourself acknowledge you're looking for something. We can do that too. So culture, we can notice and ask questions with our friends and family and say, well, why do you think this? Why do you think movies are about redemption? What's going on in Top Gun that is calling us back to Jesus? You can use all kinds of culture things and ask questions uh, to help us help people know Jesus. Okay, so then Paul reaches his final point. 30 through 31. In the times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has a fixed day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has appointed. And this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul basically says it's decision time. 
So, so some people could look at this passage and say, yes, this is God. See, I told you, God is judgmental and harsh and condemning. He's looking to, to throw people away and send them to hell. You could look at that. But what Paul is saying here is, if you notice that, he says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. He means that all of history, for thousands and thousands of years, God has waited patiently and been gracious and kind. Oftentimes, the God of the Old Testament is seen as condemning, harsh, murderous, brutal, vicious. Don't you hear those stories? Why is God so mean in the Old Testament? It's thousands and thousands of years of God's patience, and it's one little family member, one one little slice of humanity, Israel, where all over the world, God is being patient, waiting to send his son. Now, I don't know what happens to those people who who were before Jesus and never had the opportunity to hear Jesus or to hear about him. We'll let God figure that out. I'm sure there's lots of different ideas and uh, different theologians have and philosophers have all kinds of different points about what's going on there. But what Paul is saying is, with Jesus now coming on the scene, the time of ignorance is now over, and now there is a time to make a decision. You have a choice. You can choose to accept this Jesus and trust in him and take on what he's done for you. Be willing to say, yes, Jesus, I need you. And he wipes away our sins and he gives us life. Or the alternative is to say, I don't need Jesus. I will stand on my own merits. And no one can stand with their own merits. We can either stand on the merits of Jesus and trust in him or our own. And the Bible says we're all in trouble if we try to stand on our own merits. So, Paul says, what are you going to do? It's decision time. Do you want to listen to, you want to follow Jesus, or do you want to try to find your own way? Do you want to become like your own God and make your own strength, live in your own strength? Paul is offering a life filled with meaning and purpose and acceptance and grace found only in Jesus. And the core of his message is, is this, that this guy named Jesus resurrected from the dead, and that God through him will one day Uh, bring judgment to everybody and everyone's going to have to choose that's the core message that we have and so will you will we trust in the work of jesus or our own those are the choices and paul shares this message with athens this is the message that we can bring to people we have a message of hope and joy and goodness and life that this world desperately needs there are people in our neighborhoods who are straining trying to earn their way who are seeking spirituality, seeking ways to live a happy or good life, and they are exhausted and tired and broken. And we have a way of life that brings peace and hope. It starts in the person of Jesus. So I think this message that Paul preached on Mars Hill 2,000 years ago still is applicable today. We can know the unknown God. We know the God who wants to be known. He wants to have people know him. God is the source of life. And just like Paul brought Jesus with him everywhere he went, so we also, when we know Jesus, we bring Jesus with us everywhere we go. So are we looking for opportunities to share Jesus? Or are we just trying to survive? Are we just putting our head down, leave me alone, I want to just get through the situation? There are people around you that need hope. And you have hope living inside of you. Are you looking for opportunity to share the love of Jesus? Ask God to give you those opportunities. I mentioned that a few weeks ago, and I've had a couple of friends. I, said, I started praying again, as I often do. Lord, give me opportunities to share, share with people about Jesus. And people started calling, asking to, to meet with me. I thought, hey, the Lord is answering my prayer. If we pray that God will put us in places to talk to people about him, guess what he'll do? He'll do it. Do we want to be people who share the love of Jesus or do we want to keep it to ourselves? I think we want to share this good news of grace with others. Pray for people around you. Ask for God to open those doors. He will. Uh, Maybe maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're here and you say, you've tried the method of trying to earn salvation or you look for spirituality in a variety of different ways. But you're tired and you, you've tried different things, you say, I, I actually, I, I need to turn my life over to Jesus. He is the place where I'm, I'm wanting to find hope in life. Well, today we can pray for you. You recognize that 
He, he will take away your sins. He will offer you grace and forgiveness and acceptance and love. He will provide that for you today. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so kind. Thank you, Lord, that for most of us here, you've put people in our paths, uh, like you did with Paul, who told us about you. God, thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of a people who know you, who know your grace and forgiveness. And Lord, there, there might be people listening today who don't yet know you and are now hearing about you and wanting to turn their life over to you. So Jesus, we say, um, welcome them and turn, help them to t- submit to you, to say yes to your invitation, and Lord, begin to dwell inside of them, changing their soul, making them a new creation, as you say. And God, for many of us, we have friends and family members who need you. Lord, will you begin to open up doors and opportunities for us to share your love with them? God, help us to find opportunities of commonality. Help us to begin to ask questions, not in ways that are condemning, but actually just begin to get to the bottom of what they actually believe that, re- that shows and exposes how their, their ideas are faulty apart from you. Lord, it shows that they actually do long and desire to know you, the God of life. God, help us to find ways with love and grace and patience and acceptance to, uh, to lead them to you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace and kindness. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, two questions today. Number one, in our society, where do you see people longing for Jesus? So when you're in your small groups, when you're talking with your friends, where do you see people longing for Jesus? Now, here's my, if I can be honest for just a second, I have been honest, but let me just say, I'm I'm a little nervous here about this, because this question can just really dive into being really negative about our society. The hope is not to be negative about our society, but actually to be hopeful for our society, to say, where are people longing and they're missing it? And we can acknowledge and say, oh, those reactions, their negativity, their criticism, their, their anger, their whatever it is, actually points to a need of God. So we don't want to be negative here. We want to be positive that we have a message of Jesus. So when you start talking about it, don't be negative. Examine it and point, point towards hope. The next one is, who do you think God is inviting you to share him with? Who in your life are you praying to God that he will open doors for? Tell in your small group, say the names. You guys can gather together and pray about those names together. So in our society, where do you see people longing for God? Where are you noticing that? And then who do you think God is inviting you to share him with? Pray for those things because we have a, we have a, news that will change people's lives. They will become new creations. We have, we have great opportunity here to lead people to Jesus. All right, let me pray a prayer of blessing over you. Uh, I believe the Lord wants to bless his people. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Intersection, have a great week. Go in peace.